this thing that I was so passionate about doing all happened because in my future timeline as a chef, I'm going to come across these clients that really need my help. And I'm going to like bring so much light into their world. You're a chef and you're thinking about how to venture into the private chef space, how to set yourself up for success from resume to first interactions with your clients, as well as succeeding at the job. Our one-on-one -on -one coaching got you covered. Go to www.privatechef.cc and connect with me. Decades of experience can be your support to seize the next private chef opportunity. Welcome to the Private Chef Podcast, serving the 1%. I'm your host, Hannes Hedgy, and on our show, we speak to the best chefs, how they honed in on their skills to excel in the industry, and what it takes to work as a private chef for some of the most exclusive clients in the world. Welcome back to the Private Chef Podcast. I'm your host, Hannes Hedgy. Today, we're joined by Chef Anastasia Riva a seasoned private wellness chef with over 15 years of diverse culinary experience. As a certified holistic practitioner, Chef Anastasia creates healthy, green, vegan, high-protein options for her clients using sustainable and organic ingredients. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today, Anastasia. Welcome to the show. So now the interesting question is, what, what, what are you currently learning that unfolds in the next chapter? So I've never worked in a commercial kitchen. So when... I had a divorce, left Malibu, moved to Orange County. So my clients are all up in LA. And so I'm like, I'm just going to take a year and a half or two off and I'm going to go apply for a corporate job, a commercial kitchen job. <laughs> like I'm going to learn this year as like continuing education. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, but where do I even begin? Like my resume is just private chef and holistic health coach. and you know, um, don't have that much under my belt in terms of like experience, except one category. So I'm like, oh, I guess I'm just going to have to start at the bottom. Prep cook, <laughs> whatever. I just want to get my foot through the door, right? I started just researching. I'm like, oh, bona fides with Compass Group. Oh, blah, blah. oh, there's a position for Blizzard. I worked for Blizzard Entertainment or applied for Blizzard Entertainment mm -hmm. as whatever position that was on their feed. And usually in those kind of circumstances, circumstances, they hire in-house in the system, from the system, right? But for some reason, I got an email like five days later. No, not even an email, a phone call, actually. Phone call stating they had received my resume and my video questions answered and that they would like to proceed with a formal interview. It's like five days later. I've never even applied for a regular job in my entire life. So I'm like, oh, I guess, guess this is how it goes. So <clears throat> I go in for the interview and he's like, well, you're overqualified for this job position, but you're lucky. We are trying to look for a health and wellness type of chef <clears throat> in our catering division, getting the orders from the CEO. Because apparently CEO, Blizzard CEO was <coughs> vegetarian, vegan, something like that. Mm -hmm. Health conscious. <coughs> Excuse me. And so um, he goes, let me go get the, the guy from that department. Just, you know, hold on. And then I have another interview <coughs> right then and there. He comes in, reviews my resume, and he goes, you sound like the perfect fit. I'm like, oh, okay. <coughs> I don't have commercial kitchen experience. I'm here for the experience. And. They're like, all right, well, let's start you. This is pre-COVID, so 2019. <laughs> so I went in and, um, boy, yeah, I got a lot of, there's a lot of politics in the kitchen. I didn't realize, I'm just so used to working by myself. And um, a lot of male energy in the kitchen. I think yeah. I was the only female chef in the kitchen. That yeah. was that's for another podcast. No. <laughs> and, and sometimes you have women in the kitchen, but they don't have any female energy left because they've been in the kitchen. So long. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, totally. Because they have to, you know, hold masculine. <laughs> so that in itself is such a learning curve for me. But I did learn fast pace. Come on, let's push these orders out. Like, I'm just like, order up. Oh, you know, my head was just like all over the place. Cause I'm so used to doing things on my time, like 
slow, relax, communicate with the clients, you know, there's no middle person. There's no like, just very chaotic. Thank God for COVID. COVID happens and we all get laid off. <laughs> but we got paid laid off. We got paid laid off to all the way to August. Yep. Lizard paid us. So then I reassessed and I said, oh, I think I'm going to go back to private. <laughs> but that time at Blizzard was, I only needed that time to learn what I did. Yeah. And from that little short amount of time of what I learned, how the commercial kitchen flows is what I now have instilled in, you know, my billionaire client's commercial kitchen. And, but if I had not had that little scope of time, I would not have been equipped to be in the position that I am in. Mm -hmm. So like anytime where you're like, oh man, I don't, don't know about this. There's always a reason. Like maybe it's not expressed to you in the way that you can understand yet, but there's a reason. There's like stepping stones to everything. Mm -hmm. I, I, and that's so interesting that, that, you know, there are those little, little pockets of experience. And sometimes it means we don't need to make a whole chapter out of it. You know, no. we just, we just need to like, okay, I understand that. Uh, it's been a good experience and and probably for me something to compare here would be like working on a yacht i've worked on yachts mm -hmm. but it was short enough that i know i don't want to do it full time yeah where i'm like okay i got the flavor of it i know i i oh. know to some degree how this works uh-huh not for me <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i wouldn't know I have not had any i do have people that I know that run chartering yacht services in the Caribbeans. And um, I said, hey, if you ever need a chef, they're like, I know, we got you, Anastasia. Like I've known him for many, 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 many years. And I've always wondered, I wonder how it would be, but who knows? I, I think it, oh. it, it very much depends. I mean, we, we did speak to uh, like Hannah and a couple other people who've been on the yacht. And we, I just spoke with Nina Wilson the other day and, there is very different sizes and dimensions and different mm -hmm. different ways on how that can go down. Like I know people who are on smaller uh, catamarans with like very intimate setting, and I think that's that that's probably more sounds like what you would enjoy rather than being uh -huh. on a hundred meter yacht where you have like yeah fifteen meter, stuff yeah. and all kinds of people you also have to feed on right. top, and there's like a full full commercial blow going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems like operation on sea, like. Just like the private residences I work for, it's a huge operation. It's not just client and chef. It's like, gosh, staff of 20 people. Yeah. You know, it's just a lot of people. So I can't even imagine that on a boat. Yeah. And, and that's, that, that's a thing, you know, you have to share space with other people. It's, it's very, very different. You don't get to go home. Have a break. Yeah. I mean, break, break reset. <laughs> exactly. You know that. So it's, it's made for, for a certain kind of individuals yeah the younger ones <laughs> more energy so tell me a little bit more about how your journey started in in the food world where did the passion for food come from passion for food passion for food has always been a part of my life since i was i mean i can think back as early as maybe eight years old um grandmother raised us most of the time because our parents were always you know working middle class working all the time, never home. And grandma was quite the cook. She's constantly in the kitchen. That's where she found her escape. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you imagine like just an old Korean grandma, always in the kitchen. And when she would have her breaks, the only thing that she would watch on TV would be Julia Child. Mind you, she's Korean, doesn't know English, but mm -hmm. there's obviously a common language with food. Like she's a chef in the kitchen. She can look at what she's doing and she always, you know, she always watched Julia Child. So I remember just like sitting next to her and just being engaged in whatever, you know, is on TV. And I remember Julia making some kind of ice cream. And I'm like, I can make that ice cream, you know, like eight years old. What do you need? I'm trying to jot down whatever I listen to on TV. And it's like eggs, milk, sugar. Of course, Korean household, we don't have heavy whipping cream. So I just use what we did have and put it in a metal bowl, put it in the freezer, went and checked on it you know, every 20 minutes and it ended up coming out as just a block of ice and an egg yolk in the middle. 
That's what it looked like. Milky block of ice with egg in the middle. So that was my first epic fail. But I was so excited. So excited to like execute whatever I had seen. What and was the feedback some... that the family gave you? Of all oh, well, first of all, what are you doing with the ingredients? Uh, you're creating a mess. And I don't know if this is going to turn out for you. Like it was always <laughs> like, you know, you're, you're doing outside of what you're, you know, you're not supposed to be in the kitchen doing this right now. You're eight years old. You're making a mess. You're just creating chaos in the kitchen. Yeah. I just felt like I failed constantly. So what, what yeah. kept you motivated to, to keep failing? Keep failing. Well, failure is very painful. We don't want to keep failing, but I've gotten to a stage where I look at failure as, oh, I feel myself getting into this space again where I feel like I'm going to fail, mm -hmm. but I'm going to look at it as, well, what happens when I usually fail in the past? Something like so expansive comes from it. Every lesson, every journey comes like, I learned so much more from my failures, right? So it's not so scary. But um, getting to that point it has been a long journey. I fell quite a bit. I failed my parents with not going to uh, dental school. I failed my parents of not going to college, you know, straight and narrow way. And because I knew it wasn't my calling from, from the very beginning, since I was young, I've always had this connection with food. It's always been there. It's never disappeared. And I've never gone to culinary school. My parents probably wouldn't spend that money to send me to culinary school. Because they would be like, You're, we're paying money for you to go be a cook. <laughs> They're like, the, the ROI on this doesn't turn around. Like, there's no return on cooking. Yeah. What do you get? What's the most, the best situation scenario you could be? Cook for someone, cook for a restaurant. You're going to be married to your restaurant. You know, you're not going to have a life, you know? Um, of course, my brother's, my brother is a um, orthodontic, prosthetics and orthotics, right? And my other brother is in business finance. They all went to college. <laughs> they all got funded by my parents. They don't have any uh, student debt. But um, yeah, black sheep me did not go the straight and narrow path that my parents thought that I should go on. Do you sometimes speak about that with your brothers and how they feel about going that route or maybe, maybe there is something that they not did not pursue in terms of the passion that you pursued well so uh they've always said they're like sis you know we look up to you you're like superwoman like you always have like a dream or a vision or when you are into something you're a hundred percent in like you're never half in half in. like you you are sold on yourself getting to where you want to go and you've never not gotten to that point like There's never been a challenge that you didn't like climb over and get to or, you know, pitfall after pitfall. But somehow you just like you get there. And we had this conversation years back and I said, you really look up to me like me, the one that didn't like follow parents route. And and they're like, we only wish we had the courage to go against our parents, you know, and just, you know, no fear of just like failing. Mm hmm. No fear of like not listening to your traditional Korean parents that said, you need, you must go to college and you must live life this way to succeed and create a future for you. Right. Well, the interesting thing there is that it's just an extension of what they think success is defined as. And that's mm -hmm. where we get to either comply or we can kind of zoom out and make sense of what, what does success look to us as an individual or. Mind you, I don't know what success looked like. I well, just know for me. Yeah, for you, how do, how do you define it for you? I have to be completely happy at what I'm doing, 100%. If I have to work eight to 16 hours doing something every day, all day, I better love what I do. Because I mean, I'm just the person, if I don't like something, it is written all over my face. There's no, <laughs> I don't have a resting bitch face. Like, I, you will know if I am upset. And it's just, I'm not going to last very long. But not go to say that, There's been times where I've had, I mean, challenging lessons to get to where I am now, where I'm not struggling, but like not happy because I want to get to Z, but I'm at X, not X, I'm at C, you know, it's like all the, all the little steps to get to the whole entire alphabet, right? It's like, I don't realize that I'm only at letter C. I have like so many letters to get to till I get to Z, right? But I'm just like in my mind, like, oh, struggling. I don't want to do this. Getting up at 4.30 in the morning, be in the kitchen by six, working by two. You know, it's like, and I'm a single mom. So I've had kids since I was 19. So I've always had kids a part of my life. 
So I have to structure in and manage single mommy life and this dream that I held so close, you know? Mm -hmm. And, but the thing is, I, my dream or vision was never clear. The only thing that was clear is that I wanted to play with food. <laughs> and then, you know, we were told to not play with food. <laughs> Your parents didn't tell you not to play with food. <laughs> <laughs> so when I first started getting excited about really like diving into recipes was playing with food mm -hmm. and specifically raw vegan food. How do I make this dish with these ingredients? How do I make it mimic this with the textures and, you know, with all vegetables and only being able to cook what 105 degrees dehydrated. It was just like kitchen is your science lab. Here are your ingredients. Do as you will. Right. So, so much fun for me. Share this a little bit with us. Why were you so much into the raw part of it? And like, maybe you can also elaborate why the benefits or what got you into it. So in theory, we'll just say in theory, yeah. right? There's no really science-based evidence. So my roommate at the time, my girlfriend, Tierra, she was like way more advanced than me in terms of like tuning in with your body, what you can do it holistically. And so she had said, oh, I'm going to go on this raw vegan diet. She's like, it's all, it's all vegetables. That's not cooked. So essentially mm -hmm. I'm just thinking she's going to be a rabbit. She's going to eat raw vegetables for, you know, and she was always going on through these like diet fads all the time. Right. And she had taken me to a restaurant and you know, it's quite expensive for just a bowl of roughage. Right. But I distinctly remember that first meal that I had there. I felt so nauseous after I had that bowl of salad because it had it's your raw food is not your regular bowl of salad. Let me just say that it's very nutrient dense. It looks like a regular salad, but beyond that, you don't know how it's actually like all the stuff that's in it. And so with raw vegan food, you have to think nothing is cooked over 105 degrees. So essentially you're saying mm -hmm. the vegetables are outside in 105 degrees for hours, like 24, 48 hours at a time cooking in the sun, right? So in theory, we're thinking the enzymes are kept intact. Mm -hmm. Nothing's cooked off by really, really high heat, intensity heat. So when you eat the vegetables and grains and seeds, nuts and seeds, everything is in its whole state, nutrient dense. So when you eat it, you're fully engaging your body with all the enzymes and all the good stuff that it's supposed to give you. So I got super nauseous that day, like really Ill, just not doing well. And she goes, you're having a reaction because you're either detoxing toxins, pushing whatever toxins in your system. So I'm pretty sure it was alcohol back then in my twenties. <laughs> so pushing whatever toxins out of my system. I'm like, that doesn't make me feel good. I don't want to eat that again. But I did try it several times after. And what I found out is I didn't have the same reaction consciously going into it, you know, thereafter. And it actually did give me boosted energy, you know, no foggy brain, um, no flemminess. I mean, it, no anti-inflammatory, you know, it like reduces inflammation in your system. So a lot of benefits actually. The interesting thing is I think the, this getting to know our body is a real journey. Like initially, at least for me, when I was in the kitchen, I would eat just about anything at any time, you know, and I would have a pizza after work at night and then go to bed and like just the worst. Mm -hmm. Took me a little while to understand that if I eat a certain way, I can feed different. But the thing is the Connecting real, the body. yeah. And, and then yeah. also just kind of tuning in over a long period of time. Like I started fasting. That's when I really realized starting from kind of zero resetting the system, what good can feel like if you allow yourself to get to a certain point. Like sometimes I would think I'm good, but if I think yeah. about what good means now today, uh, it's a very different good than it was 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. Well, 15 years ago, you didn't connect with your body. Oh, no, no. I was, I was food with how you're feeling. Also, like growing up, I was raised in a Korean family where literally, so my parents would go to Korea. We, my parents did a travel agency growing up. So they travel all around the world all the time. But particularly when they go to Korea to visit, they'd always come back with some kind of new gadget. So it was like, I think I was like 10 years old and they bring home this big, angel juicer, which is essentially like, like an omega juicer and it's metal. It's all metal. 
it's got to be like 20 pounds, mm. not 15, 20, 10. It's all metal. It's really heavy. And this is when like the first line of juicers came out, you know, mm-hmm. heavy parts, all metal, clunky. And they would bring like certain, uh, oh yeah. Oh, it came. That's exactly it. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. it's a newer version. Yeah. It looks like a pretty new version, but it's just yeah. an image. Yeah. Yeah, that's like a newer version. I mean, it looked way clunkier than that. <laughs> but that's a more sleek, modernized version. Think about 1990s. You know. <laughs> more like a meat grinder. No, it does look like a meat grinder. Yeah. Um, so, and then he would like bring, like, they called it compri, which I don't, I don't, it's some kind of herb plant that you could plant outside. So he'd bring the plant with the roots and plant it out in our backyard. And we live in Seattle, Washington. They live in Seattle, Washington. And um, he brought this and he was juicing it, right? He'd grow it and then we juice. I just distinctly remember him bringing things and juicing things. Juicing was a big thing. So we they would make this green juice and I would just be like, eh, you know, just, just making all these vegetables into liquid and we're supposed to drink it. Um, so that's like my first memory. But I remember them, you know, them instilling in me, this is healthy for you. This is what helps you from the inside out. Like this is, this is medicine. Mm-hmm. When I'm first starting to understand food is like medicine, right? Food is medicine. So such an early age, I was like always introduced to food as it, it's a key feature in terms of like how our health goes. You eat crap, you're going to feel like crap. You know, you put bad stuff in your body, it's going to come out bad. You know, it was always like food related. Or if we were sick, grandma's like making up some kind of herbal concoction, you know? So it was never like, we just need to go to doctors. It was always home remedies first was mm-hmm. our go-to. And I so mean, growing up, I think I just got that mindset. Like there's got to be a different remedy besides just like going to the doctor and putting a mask on it, you know, to band-aid. Yeah. And then oftentimes it's those habits that are the underlying driver of the condition. It's like, okay, maybe if mm-hmm. you address that you get further, like I'll, I'll give an example. I, I used to have this really bad diet and I used to drink on top and I have the stress in the kitchen and, mm-hmm. and I would just uh, use those omeprazole, pantoprazole to kind of settle the stomach and in, yeah. instead of actually turning towards the issue, I, I just be like, okay, what, what, a- what is the next pill that I can take to suppress the symptoms? Right. You need to drink cabbage juice, <laughs> drink green cabbage juice. <laughs> I, th- I think first I had to stop drinking a bit, <laughs> and, then, and then eventually cabbage juice. Oh yeah, you need activated charcoal then cabbage juice. <laughs> yeah. And so then connecting food again with health. So in my twenties, I'm learning about raw vegan food. Right. Little did I know that interest was going to lead me a set of clients. Yeah. That were on their health journey, and um, very specifically, I had a client find me through the internet and they're in a health crisis. Basically the client had had uh, two heart attacks in three months Oof. and they're like, we need to stop eating at his favorite restaurant is Boa Steakhouse in Santa Monica. So <laughs> doctor's like, you can't eat at steakhouses every single day now. <laughs> He's like, but that cream spinach and filet, cream corn, all the fat. But imagine eating that every day with wine and cheese and crackers, right? Yeah. It got to him. And they were basically reaching out to me in terms of, we need to hire you. We need clean and green foods. You know, please come help. So uh started with them. They had a panel of, you know, blood work done before. And then um, after a month of me helping them, they had panel of work done again. And the numbers came out so expansive, like good. Yeah. So they started connecting food as the outcome of the solution, right? So um, moving forward, so I had been working with them. Then they found this amazing cardio- like holistic cardiologist center in Houston, and they left for six weeks to get into some program. And lo and behold, guess what their doctor put him on? Well, Raw vegan diet. diet. Raw vegan diet, yeah. So he stepped into the facility with eight medications under his belt that he had to take on a daily. At the end of six weeks on six week raw vegan diet, before coming back to California, he was literally sent back with only having to take three medications out of eight. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they had tuned me in on what was going on throughout the weeks. And they said, can you make raw vegan food? 
or they said, we're on this raw vegan diet. I wonder how we can incorporate this into, you know, so we don't fall behind, so we can just continue on coming back home. And they said, well, lucky are you guys, huh? That's how the whole journey started off with me yeah. doing raw vegan because I was just having so much fun with it. Never did I know that 20 years later that I would actually be able to step into that role that I love so much, fully. Mm -hmm. The interesting part here is that, you know, these clients are, so as much as we would like to live that passion, which for you was raw vegan food, and kind of explore that, they really needed somebody who is as passionate about it. And so sometimes when I look at this world of private chefs, and if you are really into some kind of diet for yourself and you're exploring it, there might be an individual who really wants this too. And it's and this can be like a match made in heaven. Like there are sometimes, I, I've had personal interests which really carried into my positions and the person was so appreciative because it was not just another chef who had a Michelin star background, but somebody who, yeah. who went down the rabbit hole himself. It's very true. But on the flip side, you would never, when you're going through this process of learning in your journey, right? Getting to where you want to go, but you don't know where you're going. Sorry for the interruption. We will be right back. And if you're a chef thinking about venturing into the private chef space, this is for you. We coach you on how to set yourself up for success from resume first interactions with your clients, as well as succeeding at the job. Our one-on-one -on -one coaching got you covered. Go to www.privatechef.cc and connect with me. Decades of experience can be your support to seize the next Private Chef opportunity. You never really realize this thing that I was so passionate about doing all happened because in my future timeline as a chef, I'm going to come across these clients that really need my help. And I'm going to like bring so much light into their world, you know, like, oh my goodness, you can cook raw vegan. Well, not cook, but make raw vegan food. Not only that, it's just not regular raw vegan. It's, oh, I should have sent you photos. Like it's gourmet raw vegan. Yeah. And it's not like slapping a bunch of vegetables together, right? It's pretty exciting to me. Like I get excited just thinking about it. And raw vegan food doesn't have to be boring. It's all about technique and preparation. But on the flip side, just realizing you create something that's actually bringing awareness to their health, you know, and changing their life. I think many, many folks are, again, it's like, where are they in their journey of health? Mm -hmm. um, like sometimes I find it very interesting when I work with principals and I know I can help them. But at the same time, I know their pain isn't yet great enough to actually make a change. And, and like, once you have two heart attacks, I think it's written on the wall, mm -hmm. but e interesting enough, even there, there's people who are just like, yeah, okay, fine. I see the writing on the wall, but I, I just want to live the way I'm used to. Unfortunately, like even a heart attack, most people probably won't even like wake up to it. You know, they won't even think food is going to be the solution. They're just going to constantly look towards the medical field. And the thing that was like quite striking with my clients is the cardiologist that he, they were seeing in California said, your only um, answer is you need a heart transplant. The only fix is for you to get a new heart. So you go from, I need a new heart to, okay, I'm going to step away from the traditional way of like addressing this, step out of my awareness of like, this is what you should be doing. And say, maybe I'm going to entertain this alternative. And to realize that, no, heart transplant was not the only alternative, right? I mean, thank Imagine. goodness they took that leap of faith. Yeah. Imagine how wild that they would literally open your opt for a heart surgery. And, yeah. and I mean, the complications of that, the cost of that, it's just like mind boggling. Alternatively, you can literally just change your lifestyle. And mm -hmm. And at least to some degree, 100%. reverse and rejuvenate. Hundred percent. We're not taught that way from early, since early on, as a, as children. Yeah. Our connection. There, I think there is like no education on food and health. See, earlier you mentioned that in Korea or in your family, it was also looked at as medicine, and that's mm -hmm. that's definitely nothing that is 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 Western culture. Like I'm from no, Europe, it's not. and to some yeah. degree, my grandpa had a. <laughs> I think he had a better connection with food than us in that regard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but 
But for the for the biggest part, people look towards food as entertainment. They use it to get over certain emotions or induce certain emotions. Right. You know, it's 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 rarely about like, okay, oh. I'm I'm literally building this body and I can do something great mm -hmm. for this body or can screw this body. And and well, I think yeah. what also what isn't as obvious initially is the connection between what is going on in our gut and what is going on in our brain. Like the the kind of mental implications of having a bad diet. Well, I've always uh, compared it to, you have a turbo engine. What kind of gas do you want to put in your turbo engine? 90, yeah. what is it? 91, right? Well, well 93 if you have a real super 93, car. right, yeah. turbo. Yeah. But we have this turbo engine, but we keep on putting the 87, 89. It's, yeah. Your engine's not going to perform to its optimum capacity. But but again, it's because we're using it for entertainment. Like And, and, and the interesting thing is, once people get really wealthy, some um, some like to indulge, and then others uh, might have a health risk, and they're they're looking at the options. Some get treated, others not. But I've I've seen a lot more wealthy people become extremely health conscious, because yeah. once once you're rich and you start enjoying life, what what is the next thing you want to solve for? Is longevity? Expand. You want expand you want to yeah. expand as long as you can. You want to enjoy as long as you can. Yeah. And then if you if you look at there's robust science that like eat better, move your body, you will mm -hmm. you, you will have a better life. And then be happy and merry. You know, if you have like there's literally ten years of lifespan in having healthy relationships. Right. Very important. Yeah. With my client, once again, it's like I don't think everyone realizes they need to look to health for longevity of life. And in a situation where they're wealthy, it's like yeah, they like to overindulge until there's like a health scare. It's usually some kind of health scare that like is the catalyst to their change. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, well, because otherwise it's business as usual. You no, know, if if if, mm -hmm. and as you said, there are some people like my father-in-law who had a heart attack, and he's not willing to make changes. Mm -hmm. So then you're like, okay, you're eating the same kind of fried food, the same kind of uh, yeah stuff uh, i'm like okay that the no. unfortunate reality is that that has a certain outcome right it's that's very scary yeah but then, then these those are people choices you know it's right. they think they're making the right choice for whatever their experience of life well i also feel like they haven't it didn't scare them enough you know everyone's baseline is different right yeah <laughs> how does your family feel about now that there is like a, a bigger picture like you know there's actually also real money involved in having having the ability to be a private chef, how do they feel about it now that from originally, like there's no money in cooking and this doesn't make any sense to, I actually work with some of the wealthiest people in the world and then turn around the health, which is so, actually- So yes, it's always even. been. And you know, I've never gone to culinary school. I've just always hold this vision of, I'm going to work for someone that's going to need me and I'm going to, it's going, I'm going to love what I do and it's going to be someone of importance not importance to me, but someone that's going to be noticed or mm -hmm. the word known celebrity. What do you want? Whatever you want to call it, put a name yeah. to it, whatever. So, um, I lived in Malibu for 10 years <clears throat> and I didn't know how things were going to transpire in terms of, cause I was, I had my third child. I was staying at home. My ex-husband did a medical marijuana company. So I was the in-house baker. So I you know, I did in-house baking for the company. So um, I didn't know how the private chef thing was going to all unravel or how it was ever going to actually come into play. So it was like my daughter had ballet with um, a, what, one of the girls and the girl's father was a, a retired uh, NBA basketball player. So and I was good friends with the mom. And so she had invited us over and she lived right behind us. She had invited us over to have <clears throat> her daughter's birthday party. And they also love raw vegan food. So I've given them raw vegan dishes and, you know, have um, been over at their house quite a bit. At that birthday party, they introduced me to my first long-term client. Little did I know, because she was like, hey, Anastasia, I want you to meet my friends. You know, we've been friends with them since they were really young, I think right when they got into MBA. Michelle's looking for a chef. You should trial with them. You know, and I ended up being with them for like eight, nine years. Yep. And little did I know, even going into that, that was also going to be all geared towards health. So I think when I first started with her, she had 
she had she had just had her third child and then she you know over the years she got pregnant again had her fourth so each child had different restrictions mm -hmm. like we had the two older that were just you know regular and then we had middle child that you know needed vegan and then you know the youngest was allergic to everything like everything you name it he was allergic to it <laughs> So we really had to navigate so carefully since he was little, like baby, just eating his first foods, having aller allergic reactions. And so I think now he's like eight, nine years old and they had moved out. They don't live in California anymore. So when they came back to visit, they're like, can you make us X, Y, and Z dishes? You know, he would love to eat those dishes again because he's gotten so used to it. But I was making like 14 meals a day, four different dietary restrictions for many, 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 many years. But all those years was like training for what we're to step into. Yeah. Every experience, every client was like stepping stone to where you're going to go, stepping stone to where you need to go. Yeah, that's, that's the interesting part of the journey. Like you can't connect it. And sometimes you pick up stuff that you think doesn't fit there like mm -hmm. but then somehow it fits there it's and somehow I'm, like I, I i used to do a bunch of nutrition work for one of my early clients and and initially <clears throat> it was uh, i really didn't embrace it to be but then eventually it, it it really gave me a sense of recipes and nutrition values and, and now it became second nature in in a way where it really helps me help other chefs make sense of it mm -hmm. yeah I think it started to slowly become mainstreamed, like more awareness around food and yeah. its effects, the good and the bad. But um, yeah, it's slowly just like every client that I've been approached with, and it's always been, you know, word of mouth, has always lead me into like the next chapter of what you're going to learn. It never stops. The learning never stops, by the way. You, you never, I'm still going to Z. I haven't gotten to Z yet, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, this journey, just getting to where I am has been just like one lesson after another. I never, oh, I didn't even actually incorporate how I even got to the clients that I've gotten. Like how, so when I applied for Blizzard, right, I didn't know where to begin. So of course I was like, oh, let me make a LinkedIn account. Yeah. So 2019, I make a LinkedIn account and, um, you know, write up my resume on there. <clears throat> so. Remember, I made up a LinkedIn account. I got an email when he, yeah, it was right before the new year. Got an email from a gal on LinkedIn. And she, uh, she actually was the one that opened me up to this 1% niche market. She goes, hi, my name is blah, blah, blah. You know, I come across your profile. I think you'd be a great fit for my X, Y, and Z client. And first thing I said was like, Hi, how are you? Um, may I ask how you have you found me? Because I'm at this point, I have not done any kind of internet marketing or yeah. connection, networking, nada. So now when we talk about connections again, right? Give it your all. Me making my resume account on LinkedIn in 2019, and it was like basic. Remember I told you I didn't even know what to put on my resume. Yeah. Right? It was basic. That resume came in front of a, a person that saw the value in what I did and contacted me close to 2024, years later. Yeah. That resume that I thought was just a crappy old resume, I just need to put something out there so I can get my foot through the door so I can get into a commercial kitchen. Never would I have known would I get to the position. So she said, I have a tech giant who's moving to Laguna and he is uh, looking for something like you. Yeah. I'm like, wow, this is exciting because also during that time, I had two clients that have moved away out of state, actually. So for, for me, who does private, two privates, it's my whole income. Yep. Although I had known for, you know, a year in advance, it's still like, oh my goodness, I need to make shifts and changes. And I was at a time in my life where the word of mouth wasn't happening. It wasn't instant. It wasn't, you know, something wasn't happening. So I was like, I was grateful for this, but here's the catch. Never have I worked with a recruiter. She was a recruiter. Mm -hmm. They sent my profile to the can, you know, to client. Client approved. They wanted to have me schedule for, you know, one, two interviews before your trial date. They went radio silent. 
radio silent. Nothing came of anything. Nothing. And I'm just like, it's like, I felt like I was breadcrumb. You give me a piece of candy, I want the whole bar, you know? Like, what happened? Like, is this, is this what happens? This is the process? And then she went on to say, well, you were the perfect candidate, but things can go like this. It's not your fault. It's not their fault. It's just what is. <clears throat> and so <laughs> that was my first hit. But that was a catalyst for me to like, oh, there's a whole nother market. Like, I didn't even know this other world existed. Of course, the 1% need chefs. Of course, they want their own private chefs, right? Yeah. And so um, that made me improve my resume, like make it so perfect. I spent, actually spent months on it, perfected it, put it on LinkedIn, you know, linked everything. And then I started realizing, oh, there's agencies, not just recruiters, there's actual agencies, housing agencies. So then I, um, I found this one agency and they're like, oh, how did you come across? I mean, it's a older established agency. Like, I think they have enough clientele. It's like, or candidates. It's like, oh, how did you find us? Right. I think I came across some job posting, found them, called them and I was applying for a position and they go, oh, um, well, this position has actually been filled, but reviewing your resume, we actually think you're a great fit for this other position where they just trialed with the chef and I don't, they didn't think the chef was going to stick. Mm. So <clears throat> they're like, let me streamline your application into them and get it in front of them because we need to fill this empty space with more candidates. <clears throat> so I said, okay. They sent in my application, they approved it, and then it went fast on their end. They said, yeah, it looks good. Let's have a formal interview. They already had an in, uh, in-house chef, but they wanted to split. They needed two. Mm -hmm. So I had the interview with the estate manager. I had the interview with the in-house chef. Everything went great. Great rapport. Great. They were very good at communicating. And then they set a date for my trial. So we went, I went for my trial date. and. Everything was fine. Everything was great, but I didn't get the position. And there was no negative feedback. Welcome to the world of private shipping. So I said, is there any kind of feedback? So at least I can learn from this and like, you know, take it with me, right? They're like, we love you. You know, I'm obviously talking to the management, right? Food was great, but this is what happened. They had received a referral from friends and family. And before they decided to decide, they wanted to trial with it. Mm -hmm. So then I'm like, okay, no negative feedback. Everything's great. I was visioning working there, right? Yeah. Dream blown out again. But this one was really hard on me because I felt like this one, I actually seeked it like i did the work yeah i found it i seeked it i no one came and presented it to me and um i felt like it just got taken away again i felt like the br bridge is burned again how am i going to build this thing up and uh i was very very i wasn't good not in a good headspace at this point i haven't been working for six months and i'm like i need to get work so my best friend, who I've known for 20 some years, she is an interior designer for the 1%. And so apparent, something happened with one of the client's chefs. She's in house, so she knows everything that's going on. So she had presented, hey, my best friend's a chef. If you guys are needing someone right now, let me get, let me get her CV in front of you. That evening, it was a Sunday evening. She goes, Anastasia, send me your CV now. Like, just send it. I'm like, huh? Just send, send me it. <clears throat> I sent it. This is Sunday. I get a phone call on Thursday for an interview. And I had forgotten that I had already met this property manager before, actually. I, Sarah had gotten invited to one of the events. And I had came with her. So I had met some of the people. I said, oh, okay, I remember speaking with you. And, you know, he proceeds with the interview. Everything goes great. He goes, so how, how, how soon do you think you may be able to start? Uh, I guess, I guess soon. 
you know, just get back with me with some dates and, you know, I'll get back to you. We hang up. He calls me back. I think it was at this point. Okay, so interview was at 3. We were done at 3.30. He calls back at 4, 4 p.m. Can you come in now? <laughs> what? Can you come in now? Our chef has gone rogue. I'm like, come in now. Uh, I'm in Venice right now. To get to Beverly Hills will be thick of traffic. But I'm like, okay. You want me to come? Yes, we need you now. Our schedule is they need to have dinner pushed out by 7 p.m. That is our schedule for today. So my partner, he does reality TV, and he's done a lot of chef reality. He's like, oh, my goodness, I feel like we're on an episode of Top Chef. Truly, you should have just popped up the camera right there. I'm like, You're now just, we got to rush to Beverly yeah, Hills here. Here's your challenge. Get dinner out by 7. Uh -huh. So I am in the car. Driving. And at this point, they're sending me the preferred list, right? Food list. I have to go through the list. I'm like driving, trying to read the email on my phone doc while I'm driving. And I'm looking at the preferred list. So I'm thinking in my mind, okay, I know the ingredients, yes and no's. What am I going to make? What am I going to make? I'm going to make chicken marsala. Okay, chicken marsala. We're going to make chicken marsala. <laughs> they're like, just make anything that you can make from the, you know, out of the ingredients you uh, in the fridge yeah or yeah. yep so go go to the property open the fridge most of everything is there order some things on instacart have it delivered by now it's already 4 45. i get there nearly five our instacart order i think got to the house at like almost 6 50 or 5 50 i mean you know yeah. it's an hour obviously i'm prepping everything else pushed it out by like 7 10. And that's only because he wasn't ready, not because I wasn't ready. <clears throat> you know, things change by the minute in those situations. So let me ask you one question. Did the principal know what was going on? No. I mean, could you imagine if the cameras were on me? Very high intensity that happened within an hour and a half. Yeah, I, I was just wondering because, <laughs> you know, it could, for example, be that the principal has no idea what's going on. And then on top of him, it's like, what, is, what am I eating here? This this is yeah. what we usually eat and give you negative feedback. Meanwhile, you've been throwing uh, your your weight and your life around for three hours to try to make it happen. Yeah. So push the food out and the um, the girlfriend had said, I want whatever he's eating. Can you ask chef to make more? And so they run back. The butler comes back. He's like, we need more masala. She wants the masala. I'm like, Huh? Okay. Whip it up. Oh, yeah. Send it back out. And then they finished up and all the plates come rolling in. And I'm like, yes, clean plate club. Nothing left. And so I guess that was my interview, my trial. <laughs> and, uh, and as the story goes, it's like uh, the state manager had had a meeting with me after. And he goes, how did you know his favorite dish was chicken marsala? I had no idea. I'll just say divine guidance. I have no idea. Somebody whispered in my ear, you're making chicken marsala while I was driving. <laughs> Nailed that, it. Sometimes you get easy? lucky. Yeah. And so here we are. I got the job, but not the traditional route. No recruiter, no agency, no background check, none of it. I was just submerged in. Mm -hmm. And this this is why I love these uh, episodes too. It's because there is, yes, there is a traditional way and there is none. Like there are so many stories where people are like, this is how it went. And, you know, then suddenly I was a chef and I love this. Like I love this. Like the way this went down, you, it's when preparation meets luck, you know. You were yeah. ready. You knew what we were doing. Uh, for whatever reason, you knew what to cook in that moment. And yeah, for there whatever you are. reason. And I, you know, I was so upset about not getting the, the previous job position. I was so very, very upset. I mean, I think I was like downtime six weeks. <clears throat> but in hindsight, if I had told myself the client that you're waiting for is on his way, he's going to be worth three times more than the previous client that you've been crying over. Mm -hmm. You never know. You just, we can't be hung up.
we never know what is in store for us. We just don't know. Yeah. And sometimes we like hold on to something that's not worthwhile holding on to. And then attachment. Yes. Gotta let that go for something better to happen. Yeah. And I think the reason why I had stepped into that house to see, it was almost like, this is how this household runs. And then it's like, but this is the household you can be at. Hmm. Because the way that both house, all households run differently. Yeah. But that particular household was very, very, by the second, lunch served at 1.15. You know, then they're on block schedule. Blah, 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 you know, and you don't even get to see the principles. Well, you see the principles. You don't speak to them. Yeah. You know, you need to go back into the kitchen. Yeah. They, I don't think they had a butler because I was serving doing that. So um, you need to go back into the kitchen because after every meal, they will be doing written reviews. For the meal, what? Yeah. For the one, the job that I didn't get right before. Yeah. Like yeah. you have paper reviews or a feedback. <clears throat> it was just too, um, how do you, stuffy? I don't know. Yeah. And then I got into the energy of, you know, the current position where it's like such teamwork. Like the principals did not know what was going on behind the scenes until after they had finished. You know, it was like, oh. And then they came down, they came down and said, Oh hi, nice to meet you. Thank you for thank you for showing up. <laughs> this and this is where I find it so important that that the principals eventually know what what happened. Like yes, ideally in our world we want to keep everything in a way where it doesn't touch them because they have bigger things to work on. Have enough, bigger issues, yeah. But I think for the degree of showing appreciation they will need to know because otherwise mm -hmm. they will never reward people that go the extra mile which is to right. some degree it's expected of us but i think right, it's, right. it's still it still makes a, a very good relationship overall and work environment if if the principal is filled in and can show appreciation for something like that yeah absolutely so yeah that's been my wild ride of the journey <laughs> but i would have to say such where i'm at now just great team cohesiveness <clears throat> and the energy of the environment is very uplifting. So who do you, who would you say creates that environment? Is this something that comes from the team? Is it something the principles allow to unfold? Like where, where all does it, it come from? Yeah. I believe, first of all, it does start from the principles and how they engage with the household. Mm -hmm. I would say he's, he treats his staffing with care, like concern, care. And in return, we, as their staff, put a lot of care towards our work. It's just a domino effect. And everyone, I mean, it's a communication thing. And on top of that, like our boss, like executive management, they're really good at communicating and buffering everyone, mm -hmm. you know, but it's all a team effort. There's so much more psychology to the position of work than the work itself. Mm -hmm. not, now you pick me up on one of my favorite lines here. So I, I keep saying for years now that the private household is more psychological warfare while the commercial kitchen is like actual warfare, you know, and you go from kind of the physical to the mental. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot of mental. Well, there's, there's emotional intelligence, there's anticipation, there's, you just have to be tuned in more. Mm -hmm. Like you can't just like throw out orders and stuff and no, it's, it's just different. You have to know when to speak, when not to speak, when to step into a room, when not to step into a room, right. you know, uh, there's so much more nuance to this. No, there is. And quite honestly, with this, with any work position, if we can have some kind of a, a psychology one-on-one -on -one before step, it would help so much. It really would. Because we all have different learning styles and it, we look at life all differently, right? You know, there's some jobs that match based on psychology tests. Yeah, I've, I've been right. interviewed with complete mm -hmm. like psychology tests that are like an hour long before I was even in the actual interview process. Mm. Um, Which is great. And then there's, there's some other kind of, some families use a psychological matchmaker and try to see like a coach you know, whether it's this person is a good fit for the overall mm -hmm. environment that they want to have. And 
So there's different different ways to go about that. Yeah, I think it would be very helpful, right? Yeah, I, I guess it also depends, like how how much do they care? Like, see, sometimes the energy comes top down from the principles, and they themselves <laughs> don't know what healthy looks like. So what they're right. what they're creating is not necessarily a structure or an organization that serves the larger well-being of everybody in the household. Uh, and then there's other people who are very tuned into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, personal preferences for sure. I'll touch up on that quickly. Years ago, I put uh, my resume on estatejobs.com. Oh, I, oh my goodness, talk about estatejobs.com. But then one of my principals, uh -huh. uh, estate managers, chief of staff, found yeah. me there. And um, they flew me to Florida where they were and everything. And and I, I was just like amazed in the same way that you were, because uh -huh. before that I got my jobs differently. Like I would have never thought this is, this is an extremely well-known family. Um, I would have never thought that their estate manager would find me there. And it speaks to having, having these seeds floating in the internet. It speaks to having a LinkedIn presence. It speaks to having your resume on the pages where it matters. It speaks to mm -hmm. being in the kind of in the catalog of agencies. Like every individual point is a, is a seed that you're planting and, mm -hmm. and so, some will grow and others won't, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I would have been ever so lucky if I got a response from one of my estate jobs. Application. I mean, there's a time when I was just like, in the dark abyss of just sending in resume, getting on phone. I mean, one thing is I never stopped quitting. I kept on pushing. Yeah. And that's, th this is so important. This is so important where <clears throat> like, sometimes I get a little bit almost upset with people. Like I, I forward jobs on LinkedIn all the time to just to keep them floating in the communities because people mm -hmm. want work, need work. Like just take a look because I have a little bit of reach, but then, there's people who literally just go interested in the comments. Really? You think you will get one of the highest paid chef positions in the United States by saying interested on the bottom? Like All right. It takes a little bit more effort than that. Like it takes, right, right. takes what you're doing, you know, putting yourself out there, going mm -hmm. to events, meeting people, being available when it counts, you know, and then pursuing, pursuing, pursuing. Right. Just don't give up. Every setback is a leap forward. Yeah, but it it takes that effort and faith at the same time. Like you 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 gotta kind of you gotta have the the goal in in mind some degree. Like yeah, I will I will work for a client. I don't know what that exact client. You Looks gotta, like, gotta yeah. clarify it for yourself, and then you just gotta put a lot of effort behind it. And like I think people are kind of delusional about the timeline <clears throat> that that it might happen in. They maybe they want to work come from the commercial kitchen and go into private. And I think it just happens within two to four weeks. And the reality really? is most interview processes are not like that. Like, and Oh, you're saying in, most people will think that that process can be two to four weeks before. Yeah. They for themselves think that because they, they, <clears throat> yeah. they haven't really considered that this might be a six to 12 months transition for them. It is. I mean, I remember my thing was all word of mouth. Yeah. So when I had to actually actively try, I was like, oh my gosh, it's six months. Like, I don't have income coming in for six months. Mm -hmm. Whereas I, my partner was like, um, do you know that's normal? <laughs> like, it's normal. I'm like, it is? <laughs> yes, it could take anywhere, three to six, nine months. I mean, for you to find the right match. Like, you have to put your... You, he goes, this, he supported me in a lot of ways. Yeah. You have to put yourself out there. Yep. Get uncomfortable. Get on the calls. Get on the, you have to put yourself out there. How else are you going to get out there? Yeah. And the reality is you won't. Like, um, if you, if you sit at home and, and you don't put yourself out there in one way or another, it's, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So just keep on pushing. You never Same. know how your story is going to end up. Well, thank you so much. Where can people connect with you, find out more about your journey or just 
Well, you can connect with me at eatwellbewellchef.com. And I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that's anything a, more. That's a good place to start. Well, you do have a LinkedIn account. <laughs> yes, that's which you, right. Which you rarely use. <laughs> Yeah, I do have my LinkedIn account. This has been very well-rounded and interesting. And then I love, again, this is a non-traditional way, you know. I like to emphasize that not everybody comes out of a Michelin-style kitchen, not everybody. There is so many different angles into this industry. Mm -hmm. But one that I've seen kind of being very consistent is somebody with deep passion who cares for something can definitely get the foot in the door and, and like through through the sheer amount of involvement and passion thrive yeah it i'm a testament <laughs> you can do it <laughs> thank you for joining us at the private chef podcast if you know any highly skilled chefs that want to take their life to the next level make sure to share this podcast with them and if you enjoyed this episode click subscribe and check out our upcoming episodes thank you for listening